are coming in, that's why. Okay, so Benita Alexander is an award-winning investigative television producer, director, writer, and narrator who has worked on a wide variety of film and TV programs. She's currently the executive producer and showrunner of the true crime series, Crimes Gone Viral, which airs on Investigation Discovery. Among Benita's great works is a documentary film, He Lied About Everything, that she produced in 2018. Her story has aired on ABC's The Con, with Whoopi Goldberg, ABC's 2020, and Wondery's hit podcast, Dr. Death. She's also a regular guest correspondent on The Dr. Oz Show. Prior to this, Benita spent 17 years in network television producing long form documentaries. Her multiple awards include two Emmys and seven Emmy nominations. Benita now uses her personal story to empower women and educate people on the importance of ethics in medicine. So, Today, she'll talk about the story of Dr. Paolo Baccarini and his abuse of ethics in medicine and scientific research. So I'd like to welcome Benita Alexander. was at the height of his career, a world-renowned cardiothoracic surgeon. His nickname was actually the Super Surgeon. And he worked at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, which is famous for awarding several Nobel Prizes, but also the Nobel Prize in Medicine. And so it's a very prestigious institute, and he worked there. He had a lot of accolades. He worked all over the world. And he was known for using stem cells in a very innovative way. He was using them to transplant the trachea, the windpipe. And in, he first made a big splash on the world scene in 2008 when he gave this woman, her name is Claudia Castillo, she's from Spain, a new trachea that he used a donor trachea, a cadaver trachea, and that took her own stem cells and basically bathed this trachea in her own stem cells and then implanted it in her. And the idea was that the stem cells would basically integrate into this um, donor trachea and it would eliminate the problem that we often have with donor organs, which is the rejection of, of the organ because it's using her own stem cells and also the need for drugs all the time. And so this was a groundbreaking procedure and this first put Dr. Maccherini on the map. And then in 2011, only three years later, he makes a giant leap and does something that's truly groundbreaking and pioneering and actually quite risky. So now, instead of using the donor trachea, the cadaver trachea, he takes a plastic trachea that you can see here, which is actually made out of the very same plastic that this water bottle is made out of. And even with the rings, it kind of looks like a trachea. It's a plastic tube, essentially, but it's man-made. It's made in the lab. And now he is doing the same thing that he did in 2008, except that he's using a plastic trachea and he, he is putting the stem cells, the patient's stem cells, onto this plastic trachea. And this is the first time we have a completely artificial windpipe. The promise of this, of course, is immense, right? If, if we could get to the point where we basically go to a drugstore, you know, you're missing a body part, you have a failing organ, and you can literally order up a new one to be made in a lab, this is you know, light years ahead in a way, but this is where this field, it's called regenerative medicine, is hey, that we can replace body parts and organs with something that is made in the lab and potentially using the patient's own stem cells. So again, this is huge. This is groundbreaking. This can change the future of medicine. And most importantly, he's now able to help ostensibly people who literally have no other hope. You know, people who've been told there's nothing else we can do for you. And so the first person to get this artificial windpipe is this man, Andamaria Bayan. Um, he was living in Iceland, but he's from Eritrea. And this was the first surgery of its kind. And it was hailed as a big success, and it seemed like Dr. Macarini was onto something really promising and really groundbreaking. And so this makes him famous. You know, the 2008 procedure had certainly put him on the world map, but this makes him really Famous. People are clamoring to work with him, write papers with him, do research with him. He's getting covered by the news all the time. You know, now he's living up to this title, the super surgeon, and 
he's really revered. You know, people really respect him. He's highly regarded. And patients from around, from around the world start approaching him. This woman over here is Yulia. She's in Russia. And she was a beautiful young mother who had, was missing her windpipe after a car accident and had a hole in her throat. She actually didn't need the plastic windpipe, but it was more of a cosmetic lifestyle thing for her. She didn't want to walk around with a hole in her throat anymore. And they had almost the equivalent of a lottery in Russia, you know, where you could submit a video to basically win the chance to have Dr. Macarini operate on you, and she won. This man is Christopher Lyles. He is the only U.S. patient, he's from Baltimore, to ever get one of these artificial tracheas. He had cancer of the windpipe, which a lot of was common for a lot of Dr. Macarini's patients. And this is sort of where I enter the picture. Um, I was working for NBC at the time. I'm an Emmy award-winning journalist. And we started looking into this very exciting, promising field of regenerative medicine. And sure enough, as we start looking into it, the name Dr. Paolo Macarini just keeps popping up. And so we get in touch with him and we find out that he is about to operate on the youngest person to ever receive one of these plastic windpipes. This beautiful little girl, her name is Hannah Ward. So she will be the first toddler to ever receive one of these and the youngest person in the world. And the surgery was going to be done here in the US and Illinois uh, because a nurse, she's from Korea, South Korea, and a nurse from Korea in the US had found Hannah in a hospital and arranged to have her operated on at the Children's Hospital of Illinois. Truly the most beautiful little girl. She had spent her entire little life in the hospital. She never left the hospital because she was literally born without a windpipe. And so she had this tube that you can see here down her throat, and you can see it there. You know, she hadn't been able to have any semblance of a normal childhood. She couldn't go outside. She couldn't, she couldn't run around. She couldn't eat. She couldn't do anything. And yet she had just the most beautiful, vibrant personality. You know, she had this, this smirky little smile, and she was just kind of full of life. And her parents, who you see here, were just the most lovely people. And like so many of Paulo's patients that came to him, he was their last hope. He was it. This is the end. You know, he, he, they said he's the only man in the world that can fix our daughter. So her surgery was in April of 2013. And here she is after the surgery, obviously with many, many tubes. Um, but it was, it was a success. It was another one of his operations that tailed as a success. During this time, um, story gets a little twist <laughs> because Dr. Macarini and I fall in love. Um, and start kind of a, a whirlwind romance. And, you know, he's the super surgeon, but he's also kind of a dream man. And he, he speaks six or seven different languages, and it's this very, obviously, classy, world-renowned surgeon. But I think the thing that appealed to me the most about him, I thought, like his patients thought, that this was this very altruistic man that wanted to help mankind, that wanted to move medicine into the future. and he seemed extremely humble, you know, very soft-spoken and very devoted, seemingly, to his patients and to changing the future of medicine. And he was a rebel in a way because he was pushing the envelope. But we need people like that in medicine, right? You don't, you don't really make progress unless you have those few people that are willing to push the barrier a little bit and take chances that nobody else would. And this was him. So we have this romance all over the world, and then we get engaged. Christmas of 2013, and uh, our wedding turns into something akin to the wedding of the century. <laughs> he, we were supposed to get married in July of 2015 in Italy. Um, he wanted a huge Catholic wedding. I'm not even Catholic, but this was important to him. And we had these beautiful invitations. And because of the work that he did, and he was working, he had a clinical trial in Russia, a very lucrative clinical trial in Russia at the time. So he was working in Sweden, he was working in Russia, he was working in Spain, Turkey, other countries. And he's connected to all these very famous people. And so our guest list was insane. That's one of the actual invitations that went out of the mail. The thing that really put this whole thing, these are my beautiful dresses, I had a couture dress designer. The thing that really put this over the top, which of course makes everybody roll their eyes when they first hear it, which I understand, is that we were supposed to be getting married according to him by the Pope which sounds ridiculous when you first hear it, and I totally understand that reaction. But the way this happened was, Paolo said he wanted this big Catholic wedding, 
And I said, well, how is that going to work? Because we're both divorced, or so I thought. And I know enough about the Catholic religion to know that they don't, they don't marry two divorcees. And he spent months, you know, going to different churches in Italy, in theory, trying to find somebody that would marry us. He tells me he can't find anybody. I said, okay, what are we going to do? And I said, let's just go and get married on a beach or whatever. And he said, well, I'm going to go to the Vatican. I have contacts at the Vatican. I knew that he had contacts at the Vatican because I had seen paperwork about work he had done on the previous pope. He's one of the world's leading cardiothoracic surgeons. He's Italian. It makes sense that he would be called to Rome to consult you know, on the pope's care. He never said he did anything dramatic, just that he was a consultant at the Vatican. And right before he goes to this meeting, he tells me that he's actually been the, pipes, the pope's private personal doctor for some time, and this is something that he's sworn to secrecy about, he can't talk about, which on the one hand seems a bit ludicrous, but on the other hand, um, you know, people in these circles, celebrities and people like the Pope, they do use private doctors because they don't want all their personal business, you know, aired to the whole world. And I have a lot of people that confirm that. And so Paolo told me he's part of this network of doctors from around the world who cater to world leaders and people like the Pope. So he comes out of this meeting, and in theory, he was going there just to ask the Pope to help us find somebody that would marry us. And he comes out of this meeting and tells me, and there's a long story behind this, but he tells me that the Pope is going to marry us himself. I didn't believe him at first. I said, the Pope doesn't marry people. That's ridiculous, you know, and called him a few names. Um, <laughs> but as it turns out, and that's what this photo is from here, I immediately went on Google and literally typed, does the Pope marry people? And one month earlier, the Pope had actually married about 20 couples at the Vatican who were all quote unquote living in sin. These were people that had children out of wedlock, you know, relationships that were not approved of by the church. And so, okay, so the Pope does marry people. And what Paolo told me was that, I mean, this is a very progressive, forward thinking Pope. And he said, we were being given the chance to do this. And it was kind of an obligation that this was no longer about us in our wedding, that the Pope needed kind of a poster couple that to hold up and say, look, I want to open the doors of the Catholic Church. I'm going to marry you too because Paul is my personal doctor and use you in a way as a poster couple to move the church forward. So I, it was a very difficult decision for me because I didn't want to get involved in any of this. I realized what you know huge story this was going to become and I just wanted to get married. But he made it sound like it was an obligation, like this was something that by virtue of being with him, I should do. So now we're getting married by the Pope. And now that it's the Pope, all these celebrity guests are coming. So Andrea Bocelli was supposed to be singing in the church. John Legend was singing at the reception. I mean, it, it was insane. It was turning into this huge, crazy event. And then, and I kind of upended my whole life for him. I had been at NBC for 17 years. I quit my job. I pulled my daughter out of her difficult to get into New York private school. Anyone who has children understands that, and New York knows that. Um, and we were supposed to be moving to Barcelona with him. He lives in Barcelona. And so kind of everything was at stake. I had given up everything for him, and we're having this big wedding, and we're preparing to ride off into the sunset. And literally, and we had 300 plus people coming from all over the world that had, he loved the single so far that people had purchased plane tickets People bought fancy red carpet attire. This is a four-day wedding weekend event with you know all kinds of events. People booked hotels. I had spent a lot of money on dresses. Um, the one thing you had told me, he wanted to plan the whole wedding and was surprising me, uh, but I didn't want him to know anything about the dresses. So I spent quite a bit of money on couture dresses. She was supposed to pay me back. I had no reason to believe he wouldn't. He was also he was always very very generous, which something I'll come back to later, but unlike other con men you've heard of, Tinder Swindler, people like that, they all they want money. He never wanted money. He was he was extremely generous. My friends, my family, everybody. So here I am, I leave my job, and then the way this all starts falling apart is I find out that the Pope is not going to be in Italy on July 11th. He's going to be in South America. And this trip has been planned for a very long time. When I find this out, I kind of just knew. I think there, have, there were a lot of things that had been eating at my gut that weren't adding up. And in that second, I just knew he was lying. And I, from there, I 
kind of put my journalist hat back on, went into full-on investigative mode and started investigating him, it would turn out that A, he was never, he told me he was divorced. He wasn't. He never could have legally married me in the first place. Um, everything, and I mean everything about the wedding was a lie. Every, every place he said he had books, every detail, it was all, nothing, nothing was real. It all existed in his head only. He didn't know any of these celebrities and leaders. He told me he was buddy buddy with and were coming to the wedding. He sure as heck was not folks, a <laughs> private personal doctor. The Vatican didn't know anything about our wedding. Nobody knew anything about the wedding. So he had invented this whole fantasy wedding. And for what reason? You know, why? Somebody of his caliber. And so now I want to get to the bottom of this. I mean, who, who does this? And, and why? You know, I mean, he, of all people, he's just not some kind of guy, you know, that I met on in a bar or something. And my first thought, and the other thing is, I went to Europe to do my own investigating. And in the house where we were supposed to move, I discovered a third family. He was living in that house with another woman and two little children. He was hiding a whole other family in the house that we were supposed to be moving into after our wedding. So needless to say, this man lies about everything. And as devastated as I was, and I was embarrassed, quite frankly. I mean, I'm a journalist. I'm the last person that should have fallen for this, and I, and I just got duped. But my first thought was his patience. I thought, if this man is lying to me at this extreme level, I mean, these are insane, absurd lies. Who makes this kind of stuff up? You know, it's, it's, it's like reading a book or watching a movie. And my first thought was his patience. I thought, there's no way if he's lying to me like this, he's not lying in his medical and professional life. It just, it, he seems to me to be a pathological liar. And that's terrifying, right? Because he's doing a groundbreaking procedure. He has patients coming to him who are hanging on to him as their last hopes. And I thought, oh my God, I have to go public. I have, I have to expose him. I felt an urgency to go public. I thought, I have to talk about this. I have to let the world know that Dr. Paolo Mancarini isn't who he says he is. So in January of 2016, this article comes out in Vanity Fair. It makes a huge splash. Unbeknownst to me, at the same time, one week later, a very scathing documentary comes out in Sweden a three-part documentary exposing his medical lies. And it turns out, tragically, that I was right, that he's been lying in his medical life. And the documentary basically says that this plastic windpipe doesn't work, that he has no evidence, there never was any evidence that it would work worse, that he never got the ethical approvals that you're supposed to get before doing a groundbreaking procedure in humans, and perhaps worst of all, that he did not do any animal experiments. And when I say any, I mean, I'm none. So he's literally using people as human guinea pigs. He told people he had done a procedure on pigs. The, the first man that ever got it in 2011, that's what he told him. He said it had been done on pigs and it worked. There were no pigs. He did start doing some rat experiments, maybe three or four patients in, a little late, and all the rats died. So now we have a huge scandal because Now you've got the combination of the personal and the medical, and now the House of Cards comes tumbling down very rapidly. He gets fired, obviously. It's a huge scandal in Sweden because this is a place that awards a Nobel Prize in medicine, and it's not just me that he's fooled and fooled, you know, he hasn't just pulled the wool over my eyes. We're talking about the world's most famous institutions and doctors and surgeons and all these people that gave him money for grants and wrote papers with him and did research with him. This is a giant scandal. People on the Nobel Prize Committee end up stepping down a chain. People like Karolinska end up stepping down a chain. It's, it's a giant scandal. And there's a criminal investigation. Um, they're behind the story in Sweden are four very brave whistleblower doctors who put their own careers on line to expose Apollo. And they were the reason this documentary had come out in Sweden. But being a whistleblower comes at a high price, um, and it has for me as well, but they were punished. You know, they, they're, just like I am, they're coming forward just to say, hey, something's wrong. I, I, you know, I want to expose this man. And they're criticized. Their jobs are threatened. Um, it was really ugly for them, but they never gave up. They were very, very tenacious, and they spent thousands of hours going through all these medical documents, every single page of every paper he'd ever published. Uh, this is 
them. Um, and the quote here is, I don't know if I'll ever get more research money. I'm totally good. I mean, they, they thought their careers were blown up all because they tried to expose a bad doctor. And then I made a film in 2018 called He Lied About Everything for Investigation Discovery. I wanted to tell my own story my way, so I narrated the film, I um, produced it, and I just wanted to tell everything in my own way. The Vanity Fair article is just only a portion of the story. And during the making of the film, they were investigating him and the criminal charges for involuntary manslaughter. And there was a press conference here, I was there, and unfortunately, they closed the investigation. They kind of threw their hands up and said, we can't do anything. Um, we agree that he essentially used people as human guinea pigs, but we can't prove that he knew that he went in knowing they were going to die. So incredibly disappointing, but the whistleblowers were not giving up and I was not giving up. He, as this is going on in Italy, he's also investigated um, for forging documents and he gets a 16 month prison sentence for forging documents. He never spent a day behind bars, but all over the world, people are uncovering things about this so-called super surgeon. And then they announced finally that they're revisiting the criminal charges in Sweden and he was charged with manslaughter. This trial just took place in April, a couple months ago, um, in Sweden, and that's me there at the trial. This is me interviewing one of the whistleblower doctors. This is me being interviewed. I was being interviewed all the time. Um, I was also there covering it as a reporter. Um, this couple, this lovely couple that I met, um, this patient, this man, he did not get a one of the plastic windpipes, but they're also suing Paolo because he operated on him for sleep apnea, of all things. And when this man came out of it, he's paralyzed. He um, has you know, a hole in his throat. He has a pressed throat to talk. He can't eat. He's almost blind. And he, the man destroyed his life, you know, and all because somehow in the course of doing a surgery for sleep apnea, he inexplicably removes five inches of his trachea. Nobody knows why, you know, I don't know if he was trying to prepare him to be the next candidate, you know, to have an artificial trachea, but they're just the most lovely couple. And uh, I spent an afternoon with them and he's, he just has such a lovely, wicked sense of humor it's in spite of everything, you know, he, saying, I'm going to make the best of my life. Um, but he's another one in a long trail of patients that feel that Dr. Macarini has destroyed his life. So eight patients around the world that we know about got this artificial trachea. Seven of them are dead. The only one that's still alive had the thing taken out. This thing doesn't work. It, it never had a chance of working. Even Hannah Warren, the little toddler, sadly died not long after getting her windpipe. He was found uh, just last month in June uh, after this trial in Sweden. He was found guilty on one count of bodily harm. Unfortunately, it's not much of a sentence. Um, he didn't even get any prison time. It's basically a slap on the hand. He's on probation for two years. And it kind of boiled down to that it was just, it's just, it's a difficult, complicated case because it's difficult to prove that he knew what he was doing. However, the prosecutor immediately appealed, and so they're not done with him yet. They're taking this up to the next level of court, and they're being extremely adamant. They said they want him behind bars, and you know, he, he illegally used people as human guinea pigs. And a bigger concern for medicine in all of this, and this is what the whistleblowers are so alarmed about, you, you give them a slap on the hand, you, they, you find him guilty of bodily harm, what message does that send? You know, does it, that sends the message that anyone that's doing an an experimental surgery or procedure, they can get, they can do whatever they want and get away with it, and you know there are going to be no consequences. I mean that's a that's a terrifying message, and the whistleblower doctors are, have written many op-eds about this now, and they're they think the precedent that this sends is alarming, um, which I agree because what rights do, does the patient have? I mean he didn't get a single one of the medical or ethical approvals that he was supposed to get. He didn't even deny that in court. You know, he just kept trying to say that all he ever wanted to do was save patients, like, you know, some kind of godlike figure. And, you know, he was doing, he was a patient's last hope. And even that is in dispute. Some of the patients were in very dire condition. None of them were going to die tomorrow, you know. So without his plastic windpipe, a lot of them would probably still be alive right now. 
you know, or at least have had their lives extended. So it's it's just so egregious and so appalling. And it's not done yet. You know, he, he keeps almost skirting the law and almost, but there are a lot of people that are very, very angry now. Um, and for, for the sake of his patients and the families of the patients, I think I feel, the whistleblowers feel, and a lot of other people feel that um, there has to be some kind of justice somehow. Um, we can't get away with this. And so in the end, what you have is medicine gone wrong in many ways. I mean, no animal research somehow was ever done. Patients were used as human guinea pigs. There was no proof anywhere ever that this idea that these stem cells were going to magically grow onto this you know, plastic tube and integrate into the body. The trachea is a very complicated you know, thing, as you know, and it's with, with the vessels and everything. And the idea that these stem cells would just sort of magically integrate into the body is, is a bit absurd. And he claimed that there was proof and that this worked. No proof widespread failure across the board to ask questions. Why isn't anybody checking this man? You know, how did this happen? How did he get away with not doing, getting the ethical and approvals that he's supposed to get? Why isn't anybody questioning him? And that's a larger question that has not yet been resolved. But I think part of the problem is with somebody like him, you know, he had this reputation. It was the same thing I, I fell for. He, his reputation really superseded him. He's a super surgeon. You know, he almost walked on water, and so he walks into the room, he's very charming, he, you know, is clearly very intelligent and knowledgeable, and he's got this very soothing presence, and somebody like that, unfortunately, walks into the room, people believe he is who he says he is, you know, so I think nobody bothered, you know, there were also lies on his CV that were um, Vanity Fair dug up, you know, where did the lies end? I have no idea, but this is a huge breakdown. You know, and there are many lessons to be learned from this about, you know, checks and balances and the reason those things exist and the reason we have to do them and, and protecting patients' rights. Because he literally lied to everybody, you know, yeah. Yeah. patients, doctors, scientists, medical journalists, I mean, everybody. Nobody was spared. So one of the things that surprised me is after I went public, I did it just to expose him, you know, and I didn't know half of what I just told you now when I decided to go public. But then people started reaching out to me from all over the world, thanking me, which was very humbling and very surprising, but they were thanking me for being brave enough to speak up. And a lot of times it was women who've also been conned, some men too, or duped or lied to by someone that they loved who said that I made them feel less alone and made them feel less stupid and less humiliated because it is really humiliating to, to stand up, especially as an intelligent person and say, hey, I just got duped, you know? And it's not comfortable, it's not fun. I mean, being in the public eye has been a, an extraordinarily difficult experience for me. People are not kind. Um, but I would do it again because I, he needs to be exposed. You can't just, you know, and if people like this count on people being quiet, which is another lesson here. If, we, if you see something wrong and you don't speak up, it perpetuates. If you don't speak up, it just keeps going. And that's what happened with Dr. Paula Macarini. Anybody, I think, that saw, okay, something's a little off here, it was sweep it under the rug, keep it quiet. Why? Because there's huge amounts of money at stake here, right? There's huge amounts of prestige involved here. We're talking about the place in the woods of Nobel Prize in medicine. They didn't want this to come out. They didn't want to admit that their star surgeon was a fraud. But it's, it's a huge lesson because if we don't speak up, nothing changes. And so now I, I talk about this in interviews all the time, um, and I'm on of a mission to empower and help other women. I tell other women's stories now, a lot of women coming to me. Um, I have a huge presence on, on social media, and really the essence of my message is about empowering women to not be shamed into silence. Um, but this goes for anybody, you know, that we, we need to speak up. We should not be shamed into silence when something is, you know, very, very wrong. And I, ever present is Hannah, that little toddler that we did a story on in my mind. In fact, that's the reason I'm wearing this color today because yellow was his favorite color. Um, and I feel an obligation to Anna and her family, you know, because when we did that story, it was we did ask questions. We did talk about some of the criticism against Dr. Paolo Macarini, but at the time, none of this was public. You know, there was nothing negative public about him, so it was a glowing documentary. You know, and I have to take responsibility for being part of producing that, and that's another reason I keep. I keep talking about this. And 
it's a twofold mission for me now about empowering women, but also exposing his egregious lies and making sure that he's held accountable. I mean, I sometimes have people say to me, oh, you've been talking about this for seven years, you know, enough already, stop, you know, how many times are you going to tell your story? Well, the answer is I'm not going to stop talking about it. I'm not going to stop talking about it until justice is served, until his feet are held to the fire, because he's walking around, you know, denying he did anything wrong and acting as if he, he somehow acted nobly, and he needs to be held accountable. And so you'll, see, you'll be hearing my story for a long time, I think. Um, but also I'm hoping to enlighten and educate people in medical institutions. I mean, this is obviously a giant failure, and there are many, many lessons, and there's much discussion about this in Sweden, but I think there are lessons for everybody, you know, that you you can't turn a blind eye. You, you have to, those checks and balances exist for a very good reason, you know, nobody is a super surgeon, you know, um, and there are very good reasons that all these things are in place to make sure that we're protecting the patient's right, and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. You know, these patients come to medical professionals because they want help, and they're desperate, and they deserve to be protected. And you have somebody like him that swoops in and wants to circumvent all the rules and say the hell with it. No, not okay. And there's a saying, with, with great power comes great responsibility, and I think that's, you know, very true for, for people in the medical profession. You know, when you have somebody's life in your hands, when people come to you as your last hope, you can't just give 100%. You have to give 150 percent or more, um, and it, I think it's just he's, in my opinion, I, I'm not sure exactly what's wrong with him. I think he's some kind of sociopath, minimum pathological liar, and there are people out there like that, unfortunately. And it's sort of a lesson in, in opening our eyes and hopefully making sure this never happens again. that 
even though I have a background as an investigative journalist, I wanted to make sure that somebody else's eyes were on it. Um, I also hired a second private investigator in Europe because it's very difficult to get documents. I mean, one of the first things that I said to my private investigator is I said, I'll bet money it's not divorced. But to actually get that piece of paper, we had to hire another private investigator in Italy, and I wanted a document from the Vatican. I, I had planned to confront him, but I didn't want to confront him until I had, you know, sort of insurmountable evidence that he couldn't dispute because I knew he was he was going to lie to me. Um, and Yes, and then I talked to people at all kinds of people. The thing was, I had all of this access at, the, at my fingertips the whole time. You know, I know people, you know, it took one phone call, you know, for somebody to check that he never, you know, he never had any correspondence with the Clintons. You know, I know somebody in the Clinton family. I called someone in the Secret Service, you know, and all these places that he told me he'd been doing emergency surgeries. That was the thing during our relationship. There were always these emergency surgeries where he had to cancel plans at the last minute and disappear. You know, and I was able to go back and track, but he was, you know, he was never in these places. He, he told me he was operating on, you know, we're never in these places. It's just, it was, it's an incredible and an incredibly intricate web of deception and manipulation. And the lies are just, they're mind boggling, actually. You know, and it, it defies logic. I still, A, you can't fathom why he did it or understand why. And, like I said, this is not a Tinder swimmer scenario. He wasn't getting money from me. You know, so there's a big question of why, which is still an unanswered one. Why did he do, you know, other than getting some sort of sick thrill out of it? And why do you let it go so far? And I was the one that canceled the wedding, you know, once I found out everything. What if I had it? You know, what, 300 people just going to show up in Italy? Then what? You know, so I don't know. So the, the surgery that he performed in Illinois, uh -huh. um, so he's an international doctor. How was he able to do that here? They, um, they got FDA approval for him to do the surgery um, because, you know, he's putting the plastic wind pipe in. And they got a special kind of medical license for him to come in and just do that surgery. Okay. So is, like, the American board of doctors, like, pursuing him to for that? I reason? don't think so because I think you have to have the patient's family on the board. And Hannah's family has been very quiet. I think this was... I think I know. Um, I was very close to them. It was so devastating for them. You know, they saw him out, and most of his patients saw him out. You know, they found him on Google, and they went to him. And so, I can't even imagine as a parent what that feels like. You know, you go and seek out this doctor to help your little girl, and they had been told that she could. She was two at the time that she would live for sure until she was six or seven. She wouldn't live a normal life. But then to live with the fact that you seek out this doctor who you think. Is a hero and he's going to come in and save the day and he turns out to be a monster you know i think that did a real number on them and i think they just want to leave it alone um after the big moment it's a big moment in my film when i went to the house in Barcelona. Um, I knew, you know, I was gathering all this information. He's lying about this, he's lying about that, but I knew something big was hiding in that house in Barcelona. And until I got there, I was kind of playing a cat and mouse game with him because I didn't want him to know that I was investigating him because I wanted to get all the information. So for a couple of months, I was still texting him and acting as if I still was in love with him and still believed that we were getting married. And someday he kept saying, we'll just postpone the wedding. And when I went to the house in Barcelona um, and found the other family there, after I left the house, he didn't see me. Um, my friends actually went and knocked on the door, and I was in the car. And after that, I sent him a text about this long, <laughs> telling him everything that I knew and calling him every name under the sun and calling him a despicable human being. And he wrote back one word. Wow. <laughs> Literally, that's all he said. Wow. And I think it was because he was caught. It was kind of game over. There was nothing left to say. Um, talk about a disappointing and romantic reaction, but just wow, he had nothing to say to me. And I tried to reach him one more time when I was making my film. He lied about everything, and I was able to get him on the phone. And he, I had to tell him, though, that I was recording him, so I knew the call wouldn't last very long. And he just he kind of said, I'm sorry. You know, this sort of 
very insincere apology. And it was, I could almost hear the wheels in his head turning, thinking, okay, I'm supposed to say I'm sorry. So I'm going to say I'm sorry. And I said, I'm sorry for what? For lying to me, to your patients, for lying about the wedding, for lying about everything, for putting people's lives at risk. I'm sorry. That was it. And then when I said I was recording, he hung up. And that's the last time I've ever spoken to him. But I did have to see him in court. So when I was in Sweden in April, that was the first time in seven years that I had seen him. And he was, I was at the front of the court, and he's probably where you are, right here. You know, so for a month, I had to sit and look at him in the courtroom, which requires some internal mental gymnastics. <laughs> Did he have any family? Parents? Anybody? 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 His mother in Italy, he flew me and my daughter there. We sat in her kitchen, you know? She made us a homemade meal, you know, in Italy. Now, in hindsight, she speaks no English. I speak no Italian. And this sweet little woman, she was crying when we left, she, you know, embracing me, embracing my daughter. Now I look back and I then he was translating, right? And she pulled out the family photo album. So, and there were photo albums that showed him as a child, him and his sister with his parents. His dad had passed away at the time, but now, I think, what did he tell that poor woman? You know, I think maybe I was a patient. Maybe I was dying. <laughs> maybe my daughter was dying. Maybe we were both dying. I don't know. But I don't, I just, how do you explain that? Somebody takes you to Italy to meet their mother and you bring your daughter. He paid for everything. He flew us there. You know, I talked to his sister. His sister's daughter was supposed to be the flower girl at our wedding. I mean, the level of deception is just nuts. Okay. Oh, one more. Yes. Um, you said you were taken aback by how cryptic his response to you was. Just wow. What would you have wanted him to say? Oh, I, I think now I understand that what I want, I'll never get. You know, I want to know why. You know, um, my fantasy now is, a, is to sit him down as a journalist and just fire questions at him, rapid fire. You know, I want to understand why somebody would do this. For what reason? And the worst part, which I think I forgot to mention, is when he sauntered into our lives on his fake white horse, my ex-husband, the father of our daughter, our beautiful little daughter, had just died of brain cancer. So that is the part that to this day enrages me more than anything. You know, it's one thing to do it to me. I'm an adult. One way or another, I'm going to be okay. But my daughter was nine when this happened. You, you walk into our lives and you're lying to a nine-year-old little girl that just lost her dad, you know? How dare you? How dare you? And, and that's so criminal and so appalling. But I don't think he'll ever, you know, uh, maybe he doesn't know why. I don't know. You know, so I've, I've kind of given up on getting that answer, which is why it was funny when I saw him in court. I always thought once I saw him again, I'd unleash, you know, I'd, I'd scream at him. And when I saw him, I realized I have nothing to say to him, you know. I mean, there's nothing that's going to come out of his mouth now. I know that. That is true. You know, I had to sit in court and watch him lie to the court, you know, lie through his teeth. And there's just nothing he could say that would change anything or make it any better. And I just thought, oh, I have nothing to say to him anymore. What did you do with her? How is my daughter? Um, she's good. She's 18. She's in her first year of college. Um, I think if she ever sees him, she will punch him. But, <laughs> um, she's got good. Yeah. Great. She has a it's kind of a dark humor joke, but also not funny. But she calls him a serial killer. Um, she's like, I tell I tell people, I tell my friends, my mom dated a serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But you know, I think the definition of a serial killer, I think it's three people, and <laughs> seven of eight patients are dead. So it's not so far from the truth, you know. Sadly, you know, it's it's a bit of dark humor, but it's. Um, in a way, it's not, you know. Um, and I, you know, we can rebuild our lives, you know. His, his patients can't, you know, they're gone. Those families can't get their loved ones back, and that's why there needs to be justice. Um, did he have any uh, uh, medical journalism or peer reviews? He does, you know, I was just talking with some people about this the other day in the medical community. Um, there are holes on his TV, and I suspect that the full truth is not yet known. There were lies on his TV. Um, some things are true. You know, he, he definitely is a real doctor. I've started to wonder 
how much it's paying um, is accurately depicted on that CV. You know, conveniently, the person that he studied with in France is no longer alive. Um, so I don't know, but yeah, he published many times um, with many people. Um, a lot of those papers have now since been retracted um, because he was lying in the papers, you know? I mean, that, that was the other thing. He was walking around, the, the first man that ever got the artificial windpipe was at a press conference saying this is working beautifully, when behind the scenes, what was actually happening, or what happened to these patients at the end is horrible because this thing doesn't work. The cells, the stem cells are not integrating into it, so it comes loose. It's dislodged and it starts rotting. So it's a rotting, there's just this rotting thing in their throats. And the mother of the beautiful Russian um, woman that you saw on the screen, the way she describes it is horrifying. You know, she said her daughter smelled like rotting flesh, you know, because this thing is just, I mean, it's, 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 they died and they died horribly painful deaths. You know, something came out when I was in Sweden about the American patient, Christopher Lyles, and he suffocated to death at the end. You know, he was choking on his own blood. I mean, it's, it's just, it's beyond awful. It's, it's horrific. Um, sorry, now I forgot what the original question was. Oh, about the papers. Um, so yeah, a lot of stuff has been retracted and everything is being, you know, checked into with a fine microscope. But, a lot, you know, the peer reviews, people believed him. And, that, and that's the danger, that's the scary part of, about this. Again, he fooled a lot of people, a whole lot of people. And they bought it, and they believed him, and that's that's where the warning is here. You know, you've got to check. Yeah. Um, two more questions. How are you feeling? How are you coping with this? Do you move on? Do you, really, do you have a relationship? How is it working? Is it affecting it? It definitely. You know, I I think I've discovered that I'm much stronger than I ever realized I was. Obviously, I my trust is you know. Destroyed. Um, it's very difficult for me to trust people and very difficult for me to let somebody in. Um, I'm very determined to not let this change me. One of the things I decided from the beginning is I'm not going to give him that power. You know, I, I, I still believe in love very much. I'm a diehard romantic and that hasn't changed because I, I don't want to change. I don't want him to give him that, you know, I don't want to give him that power too. And from day one, you know, even when I was falling on the floor to heap of tears, which I did many, many times, I would kind of pull myself up and say, okay, but he don't know, you know, he doesn't get to do that to you too. Um, and I feel very strongly about being an important role model for my daughter and just showing her that, you know, you, you get up, you get up and you keep fighting, you know. See, one last question. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here and sharing that with us. Um, I think it's it's very important, um, especially for a population like us, a nursing school. Um, because just thinking back to when I was a new nurse, like you mentioned, you know, he was a super surgeon and he had this power. You know, when you're a new nurse, you know, you oh, yeah. you sort of you look at the authority figures like the attending walks in and they come in with this authority and this power, yeah. and the last thing you think is to question. Them. Exactly. Right. So I think it's very important that nurses hear this story because it gives them, you know, that confidence in being able to question when they feel like something is wrong. I actually had a nurse, I forgot about that until you said this, from Hannah's story, who reached out to me after my story first went public, saying the same thing that you're saying and thanking me and saying that she was absolutely mesmerized by him, you know, and, and she said none of us in, in a million years would ever have dreamed, you know, that he was a fraud. Or, you know, we were all enchanted by him and nobody ever questioned him. And I, I think that's the most important lesson. If something, even if it's a tiny little nagging thing in your gut, if something doesn't feel right, even if you're wrong, you know, tell somebody, you know, say something. Because it's it's the not saying something that just keeps us going and going and going and nothing until it explodes, you know, in a horrible way like this did. Um, so we, we have some uh, some individuals who are online, yeah. faculty and others, yeah. and I just wanted to share a comment sure. of, from one of them. And this is from Dr. Tark, and she wanted to tell you that your your talk was truly empower, empowering and meaningful to her. And she's a huge fan of yours, and uh, she wants to thank you for coming to the college and sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for listening. Okay. So thank you everyone for showing up. Um, as I said, this is the beginning of 
well, I guess you can see you. So we thank Ms. Benita Alexander for coming in and starting it off for us. So we're hoping with Dr. Carrillo's permission that we'll have more guest speakers coming in and have these exciting topics that we could actually um, listen to. On my end, I would like to say basically that um, in class for my science uh, A&P class, I'm always emphasizing on the importance of understanding the science and the knowledge, right? Because in order for you to basically check the other individuals or the other doctors, you have to have that knowledge as well. So you could bring your A game and basically say, no, what I learned in Healing Fuel was X, Y, and Z, and what you're showing over here is in the case, right? So it's important, obviously, for us to also pay attention to class, right? Know all this information, so we can basically keep others in check as well, right? So I just wanted to add that there. Um, one other thing, if you're interested and you haven't seen my story, the um, 2020 special Two Lives is actually re-airing this Friday night at 9 o'clock with some new stuff at the end about the trial. So you're not obligated by any means. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a my class. We have an exam. So once we're done, we're going to go into our classroom and continue our lecture. So thank you so much, and I'll see you downstairs. Thank you.